And that was the start of the journey. I started partying with people that hung around the apartment complex during the day. Those are the people that don't have jobs. You know, what they did for jobs is usually sell drugs, you know, steal stuff, whatever. I was drinking so much. So when I got up in the morning, I was like sweating out the alcohol. And then I had that like kind of smell of urine. Even though you shower, it just doesn't kind of go away because it's like you've been laying in it all night. It took my husband. He took that drug and he was gone. And I think at that point, I already knew I needed to get out of there. I flew up to Maryland and I said, I'm going to start over. So I decided to call Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm one of those people that didn't do what I was supposed to do. I could not have outside validation. So I needed somebody there to tell me that I'm worthy. So I was looking for something outside of myself to change my insides, to make me feel better. But I'm a train wreck and I'm still selfish, self-seeking. I'm thinking I'm doing a deal, but I'm not. I met this wonderful guy who's very sweet. He goes, what happened? And I told him that my relationship just ended. He goes, do you ever think you'd get back together? And I paused. I didn't know what to say because I was still in love with my ex. And I realized I was out there hurting people again because of my own selfish needs. Green lights and blue skies are on their way. Yeah, they're on their way. Welcome to Crosstalk. I'm coming to you from South Florida. My name is Irene, and uh, I'm here to tell you guys about recovery, uh, interview someone who's going to tell us their story. We'd love you to like, subscribe, follow, reach out. Uh, tell us what you think. We want to hear about it. Uh, Dawn, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Here on Crosstalk, we kind of go through, um, and I'll ask you about your story, kind of, you know, where where it all started for you, and I, I know you have a lot of recovery time, so I want to hear about recovery and how that's been for you. So let's get started. Tell me a little bit about how you grew up. I grew up, um, I was born in Maryland, and we moved to New Jersey, and then later on we moved to like upstate New York, and so I kind of grew up in different places. Uh, my house was a little chaotic. I had an older brother who had some issues, uh, substance abuse, but probably other issues too. Mm -hmm. So there was all, that. That was the when the fear started. That okay. was that uh, disease, uncomfortableness. Uh, my mother and father split at seven, and I remember um, right around that, you know, between seven and ten, kind of not feeling like. Like God loved me because my life wasn't, you know, my parents split and I was living with a stepfather I didn't like and um, my brother was a little crazy. So I think that was the beginning of like the disease for me. Okay. And, and just, you know. Keep going? Yeah, keep going. <laughs> Tell me how it proceeds. You know, I'm going to let you kind of take it away. So at about 11 years old, my brother, who was five years older, got in a fight with my stepfather, and my stepfather cracked a couple bottles over his head. Wow. And sent me to bed, and the next morning, he was gone. And what I understand was that he moved, he, they put him on a bus, and they moved him up to Maryland to be with my dad. My dad, not his dad. He, he adopted him, but it was not his biological father. So when he got up there, he was still you know, messing crazy, was doing drugs, started doing drugs with my stepmother, started sleeping with my stepmother. Wow. They decided to leave my father, who went into a deep depression. And during that summer, my mother decided to send me up there in the middle of that. By then, my brother and stepmother had moved out. My father was not doing that good. And he took the stepmother's sister in to help watch her daughter and she did, I got in the middle of this and she didn't know what to do with me. So she's like, here, go to the pool. Here's a towel and take one of these. And what one of those was, was called a quaalude. Oh, I've heard about these. <laughs> yes. They were, they were yummy. I'm sure but... I would have loved them. <laughs> <laughs> I, w I, I did. It was, I was 12 years old. I went to the wow, pool. Wow, and she gave it to you. Yeah, she gave me quaaludes. And I would sit at the pool and I would feel comfortably numb. And they had, it had this, it was like a, a downer, but then it had like a little bit of, bit of a hallucinogenic effect. So you just kind of sit there and things like, you know, sparkled and shimmered. And it was very comforting 
th- that anxiety was kind of gone, and mm-hmm. I felt I I loved it. When that summer ended, uh, the quaaludes were gone, Ooh. and I had to go back home. So I took the next best thing, which was my parents' liquor cabinet. So at about 13, I started kind of started to drink, I guess, alcoholically. I would come home after school and I would pour myself a drink and, and sit and watch Gilligan's Island and, you know, <laughs> and drink alcohol <laughs> okay. and kind of get that ease, sense of ease and comfort. Um, I got suspended from school in like ninth, seventh grade or ninth grade middle school whatever it was yeah for... did your parents know you were um or your parents I should say your mom know that you were kind of opening the cabinet pouring yourself a drink no because I would fill the back with water okay <laughs> it's amazing how that works I feel like in my house that would not have worked but who knows <laughs> well I think at the end you know I was basically drinking water and you know, no more vodka but <laughs> <laughs> right okay um, but I, my mom was raised a, with an alcoholic father. So her biggest thing was to keep the appearance and to keep the secrets. Mm-hmm. And to this day, she's still like that. And I'm pretty open about things. And she just, you know, don't say anything. It's like, who cares? Right. Nobody cares. Right. But, um, she, to the, so my brother, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Maybe I shouldn't tell that part of the story. <laughs> um, my brother disappeared in 1988, okay. or 1985. We don't, we don't know what happened to him. Still? No. Just in 1988? 85. 85, disappeared, and still to this day, you do not know? No. And she, wow. And like, so she doesn't look for him or anything. So it's like she kind of still keeps that secret. Like okay. you, could, you could go to, you could give your DNA, you could do kind of things, but she's kind of like. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, sorry, mom, if you're out there listening, <laughs> we don't have to send her the link. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, that's, that's where I started drinking. I started, I started drinking kind of relatively, probably alcoholically, um, at around 13. I did the usual party stuff in high school. Um, I went to ninth grade. I met, uh, my higher power. His name was Steve. Mm-hmm. He was he had a car and a mustache. He was two years older than everybody else, so it kind of tells you a little bit about him. Right, right, I see. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the same grade, but he's two years older. Right. Um, and uh, he would, we would stay together through high school and for a couple years of college. And we got married. Okay. Um, and about that time, there came a drug that was non-addictive. Oh, I know all about this drug. <laughs> yes. Yeah. They've now, it's funny because now there's like shows and everything about how, how they put it out there. You're talking about obviously oxycodone, oxycontin? No, cocaine. Oh, cocaine. Cocaine. Back in the day, we're still in the 80s. Oh, oh okay. I thought, I thought we were talking about the, how the FDA was saying, you know, oxycontin was non-addictive when it first came out. But wait a minute, cocaine was supposedly non-addictive? Yes, back then it was non-addictive. This was prior to, prior to Richard Pryor. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Wow. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. Back then they were saying, but that was, you probably weren't born yet. It was like this, like Columbia's uh, export and they were saying, oh, you know, take it. It's not addictive. Yeah. It was like, it wasn't a big deal. Oh, it wasn't a big deal back then. And that was, and we started out snorting it and then, then came along free bracing and then later on came crack. Right. Let's put it in perspective of dates. (laughs) Right. Right. Okay. Got it. Um, But it took my husband. I mean, he was gone. He took that drug and he was gone. Um, And I remember one night. We were watching, I was watching TV. He was trying to go to sleep, but you can't really sleep when you do it. Mm-hmm. And he wanted me to turn off the TV. And he said that if I didn't turn off the secret police or to TV, the secret police were going to know that there were drugs in the house. And I refu- I thought it was silly and I didn't turn off the TV and we got in a big fight mm-hmm. and he beat me up pretty okay. bad. Ooh. I mean, I was. I was kind of instigating it, but he did. And I think at that point, I already knew I needed to get out of there. So we we split up that night. I called my dad, who was in Maryland. This is the same poor guy that, like, had taken in my stepbrother, and uh, that destroyed his family. And I called him up, and I said, hey, I'm in trouble. He's beating me up. Can I come stay with you? Right. So what is a father going to say? 
Of course. Of course. Yeah. So I flew, I flew up to Maryland, and I said, I'm going to start over. In my, there, you know what my problem is? Him. Right. Not me. Not alcohol. Not drugs. Him. Okay. So I got to Maryland. I had a fresh start. And I was like, my dad's like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, well, can I, I'll, can I go to school? And he's like, sure, we'll, we'll send you to college. But before I got into school, I started partying with people that hung around the apartment complex during the day. Mm-hmm. So they, those are the people that don't have jobs. You know, what they did for jobs is usually sell drugs, you know, steal right. stuff, whatever. So I ended up one night not coming home. And um, I felt really bad. And my, in, um, my, I knew my dad, I didn't know anybody. My dad's like, you know, what is she doing not coming home? And uh, so I decided to call Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, wow. Yeah. I was like, all right, I'm in trouble. So I'm going to go to call, call. So I called them and I went to the meeting and I read the first three steps, midweer powers over alcohol. And I said, probably not alcohol. Cocaine, I think I might have a problem with. And then I saw later on about God. I'm like, that's it. I need God. I don't need these meetings. I don't need to worry about alcohol right now. I just need to find God. Thank and how you. old were you? 20. Tw- 21. One. Okay, 21. 20. 21, somewhere around there. Okay, that's good enough. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it was 21. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, I think I was legally to drink. They cut me off for like a, y- a year at one. I was like... I drank at 18, and then they changed the law. I was, oh, okay. I was you were that one. one. Okay, got I it. I was that one. So. I feel like it's changed again, but I don't know. I think it's state to state. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so he, so he, I went, I decided I didn't really need, I was too young. I just got, you know, legally to drink. What am right. I doing? I'm, I don't need this, but I'm going to find God. So, um. I went to the University of Maryland, and I tried to get in. And they were like, what do you want to get in for? Or what do you want to do? And I was, I've always been, like, big on art, but I wouldn't think I was a good artist. So my backup was science. And I was like, well, maybe, let me look at the sciences. And I had gone to school before for horses accidentally. Mm. I thought it was animal husbandry. And then when I got there, they were like, do you want horse or cow? And I'm like, I guess I'll take a horse. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> got it. So I went to school for horses for a while. And they were, I looked down the list and I saw biochemistry. And I'm like, that looks impressive. If I'm sitting at a bar and I'm in, you know, a biochemist, <laughs> you're going to be impressed. Right. So I said, that's the one, biochemistry. And they're like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah. I want to go to school for biochemistry. I'm full-blown alcoholic. I'm going to school for biochemistry. Okay. So they let me in. And I started going to school for biochemistry. Did you like it? No, no. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I like bio. I don't like the chemistry part. Yeah. Okay. And I was, I I was, um, and I got a job in the biochemistry department. Okay. It's, this is long enough now with the statute of limitations that I can kind of tell you some of the things that I did. But I was working in the biochemistry department, and because of that, we had to do these experiments in biochemistry. And I was too whacked out to be able to really do the experiments. But I got my friend to figure out what I was supposed to get, the chemical I was supposed to get, and then I'd get it from the lab and bring it in and say, I synthesized this, and I passed biochemistry. Oh my God, that's so funny. <laughs> so I kind of basically cheated my way through biochemistry. Right, I don't think anyone's coming after you for that. <laughs> I, think, I think they have bigger fish to fry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, so, uh, so cheated through. I, I know a lot about that too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I went through high school kind of like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so then were you finding God as well at the time? Well, so then I, w- I was living in this apartment and... One day, these people knocked on the door, and they were one of those people that, like, painted, and, and they, uh, they, they said, you want to go to church with us? We we're, like, moving around, getting people to go to church, and we, we, do, we pick up odd jobs, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. God was on my to-do list. I'll go to church with you. And they said, uh, if you do this and this, you have to say this and this, and you get a non-refundable ticket to heaven. Oh. I'm like, perfect. I walked up. I said this and this, and they said, 
And I said, all right, thank you very much. I'm leaving. And they're like, wait, you can't leave. You're supposed to keep going to church. I'm like, I have a non-refundable ticket to heaven. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. That's all I need. I was like looking for the hook and the cheat, even with God, right? Yeah, totally. (laughs) I'm like, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. (laughs) So I started going along my merry way. And then I was going to school and things were like okay-ish, you know, I was like passing and... um, but my drinking started encroaching. You know, it was like partying on the weekends, and then weekends turned into Thursday, and Mondays were hard because I was still hungover. And, you know, and eventually what happened was I, they have a thing called academic, dis, uh, academic warning. Okay. That you, you, they like, oh, you're in trouble. You better watch yourself. I, I skipped that. I went to academic dismissal. Okay. They threw me out. Okay. So it's then I. you missed. No, I failed. Oh, you failed. I failed. I didn't fail biochemistry. You know, I failed. What? History. And I had lived part of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Okay. <laughs> and calculus was kicking my butt, too. I got to I gotta put it. I didn't like calculus. Oh, God. I went to fashion school where it was like, go shopping for homework. So I, I couldn't have done any of that. Oh. So kudos to you that you, that you did I, biochemistry, even. I wish I didn't. A fashion. Uh, that yeah. would have been fun. Well, you know, I'm using it now and so much. But I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not using biochemistry. That industry does not pay is what I learned. Unless, uh, I mean, unless you get to the top, I guess. But um, so, okay, so you're, you're got your dismissal. Now what's next? Well, there's the question. I have lost everything I've worked for. I lost my job because of, I was working for the biochemistry right. department, thrown out of school. Lost everything for the second time, really, because when I left my husband, I had lost everything. Right. But I had all this time on my hand. So what do you do? Sell drugs? No. <laughs> just, I didn't sell them. I just partied. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's what I did. I just partied. <laughs> so I get, a, I get a, a phone call or something that said I needed to show up at this, um, this late, with the counselor. I had okay. to show up at the counselor. So I was like, okay, I'll show up at the counselor. But I had partied all night long. By this time, I was drinking so much that um, I was wetting the bed quite often. Okay. And, and, and that night, I think I drank beer. And that was, that was usually really kind of made, you, made me wet the bed. Yeah. So when I got up in the morning, I was like sweating out. It was summertime. Sweating out the alcohol. And then I had that like kind of smell of urine that you just... Even though you shower, it just doesn't kind of go away because right. it's like you've been laying in it all night. And when I walked into her office, she kind of smelled me and gave me an AA pamphlet and told me to leave. <laughs> oh, well, okay. I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> all right, you're probably right this time. Yeah. So I went to a meeting. I went to this meeting, and it was in a church basement. And you're what, 23, 24? 20. Two. Okay. 22. And this guy hands me the, the uh, how it works mm-hmm. and asks me to read it. So I think I read like the, the first page. I didn't flip it over. I just like, and everybody was like, okay, good. Keep coming back. But um, afterwards, the guy that asked me to read asked me if I wanted to go to another meeting. So I was like, well, he must like me. <laughs> right all right all right i'm going yeah <laughs> like, i'm going to this new meeting yeah so i went to the second meeting and this meeting had more women in it okay and he walks me in and there's like this circle of women and he goes she's new and like pushed me into the circle and they close ranks and started handing me phone numbers this was back in the right day yeah had, yeah like, you know i love that <laughs> That's kind of what happened to me, and, and it was, you know, eight years ago, but I love that. <laughs> I love that the women kind of, like, call, you know. I know. I'm like, well, where'd he go? Where'd he go? Where'd he go? <laughs> yeah. What happened? I thought we were going on a date meeting. We were, I was getting the bridal gown. What are you yeah. talking about? You know? <laughs> totally. <laughs> um, and that was the start of the journey. And it was a, um, it was a you know, it's been, a, that was October, well, it was summer. I relapsed. Okay. Um, and then I, I relapsed in October, and my sobriety date is October 25th, 1988. Wow. Okay. Incredible. Yeah. I'm very grateful. So that person who handed you that pamphlet got you. Yes. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. 
That's and awesome. the funny thing was I, I started to go, I went back to school and I'm like, will you guys let me in? They're like, okay, we're going to let you in probationally. You have to take this one class. If you do okay, then we'll let you back in. And I did, and I did all these things. And they said, you're on probation. And while you're on probation, you have to, you have to go to your counselor every three, three months or something like that and check in. In, you know, right. Like, uh, and was order. it that counselor that it was no. my advisor, not the okay. counselor? I'm sorry, okay. the advisor. And it, at the end, be, the difference between sobriety and uh, alcohol, it, I was getting all A's and B's. Right. And it, at the end, she's like, Why are you still coming here? My GPA was so good that I could get into graduate school. Right. I got into graduate school, and today I'm a biology professor. That's so cool. I love that. <laughs> See, I would have liked the chemistry part, not the biology part. I was never good at biology, but I'm uh, good at chemistry. <laughs> I like the biology. Wow, that's so cool. Okay, so, so 1988. Mm -hmm. I, okay. So now tell me this journey in sobriety. This is oh, so yeah. cool because I know sobriety has been a journey for me and it's only eight years and you have, what, 35? So I got to hear all about it. Okay. So I'm one of those people that didn't do what I was supposed to do. Okay. I, every, that's been the theme this weekend. Everyone seems to say, literally everyone seems to say like, and in the beginning I did everything I wasn't supposed to do. And, and it seems like that's kind of the path to sobriety. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, in, I guess it, in some ways it Long can term. work. <laughs> Painful sobriety, yes. If you... <laughs> right, right, of course. So the, the first thing they say is don't get in a relationship, right? For the first year. So I heard, don't fall in love. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I couldn't, I could not not have outside validation. So I, I needed somebody there to tell me that I'm worthy. So I got into a relationship with this guy uh, named Swervent Irvin. Mm. He was quite about 13 years older. He used to wear all black and a trench coat, and he had a big scar down his face where somebody attacked him with an ax. Wow. <laughs> that sounds painful. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and he was, d did he have a lot more sobriety than you? Was he what they no. call a 12-stepper? No, he was what you call a relapser. Okay, got it. I didn't know that. He was, right. a, he was a heroin guy. Okay. And I didn't do heroin, so I didn't understand that you didn't, you, you didn't get sick all the time. Oh, I see, I see, yeah. Because <laughs> he would stop I wasn't a heroin sick. person yeah. or an opiate person either, so I don't know really understand, and I don't really understand the getting sick thing at all. Well, I didn't pay that close attention because it really wasn't about him, it was about me. Mm -hmm. and it was like <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Listen, we're being honest here. Exactly. Yeah, I love like, it. Like, do whatever you got to do, but You're my type of me. woman. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he was much older, and he should be proud to be me with me, right? You know, yeah. So. Exactly. Um, obviously, that didn't work out very well. And I struggled with, like, with relationships. Um, my, um, um, oh, I was going to say one thing. I forgot. I want to back up just one sure. second. Um, before I got sober, I, I like learn through mistakes. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would always do like, so one of the things that happened was I wrecked my car. My husband bought me a new car my, and I drove it into a telephone pole in a blackout and I got 57 stitches in my face. Wow. So when I was talking about his ax martyr, I'm like, I got a big scar too. You just oh, don't, I don't see, see it, as, it at all. Yeah. You don't see it as much. Um, but uh, that was one of the things like, okay, uh, d don't stop drinking, stop driving. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> don't drive. Okay. Right. It's funny um, how we like manipulate the situation to still work for us. Exactly. We just like tweak what we think is the problem. Like I was a big like geography person. So, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't, I wasn't the problem. It was New York. Yes. And then it wasn't New York, it was London. And then, you know, I thought that if I moved to Paris, I would hold a basket and go to the market and buy fruits and vegetables. Like, no, I was drinking like four bottles of red wine by, you know, 2 p.m. And that's what my, my life in Paris looked like, right? So yep. I was one of those. Oh, I get it. Yeah. I get it. I changed men. Right. 
So I, I, I got to one point where those dark-haired guys are really a pain. <laughs> right. it's, not, it's not men. It's just dark-haired men. Right. So I'm going to have to start getting a blonde. I got yeah. a blonde for a little while. That didn't work. But I did get a motorcycle out of the deal. So that was kind of cool. Oh, cool. Okay. I like that. <laughs> um, but so it, now I'm sober, messing around with this one guy. That didn't work. And then I started to stay sober. My, my first couple years of sobriety was a little tough. I actually was on antidepressants because I was so depressed. Mm. I was one of those that kind of crawled in. I had a hat over my face. I looked, I ca- counted tiles. I didn't want to look you in the eye. I was not in good shape at all. Okay. Um, I had a lot of regrets, a lot of um, remorse and um, self-loathing. But eventually... Staying sober long enough, I, you know, I did the steps and I worked right. through that, uh, a lot of that. But my, my um, relationship stuff didn't really work out that well. So I started dating another guy and I'd gone to uh, Yellowstone for an internship for a little while. And uh, after, while I was gone, he had started dating his old girlfriend. So oh. when I got back, I decided to use self-will on this situation and I went over to his house and I held him down and I sat on him and I said tell me you love me and you want me back (laughs) (laughs) oh my god that's amazing (laughs) I will force you to love me right (laughs) he he said no in the the, in god has such a great sense of humor after I left there I had to go to a meeting and lead the meeting on the seventh step (laughs) <laughs> oh God. Okay. Okay. So for people who don't know, the seventh step is, um, to your character defects to ask God to remove them. So you're kind of like, you know, whether it's, I don't have any character yeah, defects. Right. What are you talking about? Yeah. I don't know what that was. <laughs> oh my God. You know, and I, I, you know, it's so funny cause I recently actually did one of a seven step with someone and they had like two pages of character defects. And I was like, okay, I think that you have too many. You do, you're, you know, it's like the opposite of like, right. you know, too many character defects. <laughs> so, okay. So you, so you tried to force him. No. Right. So men were the issue in the so beginning. The, yeah. And he was a biker. Okay. Just, I should note. He was a sober biker, but he was a biker. Okay. Um, eventually I got married to this other guy. Um, at the time I, um, uh, he, we were, I was walking out of an, AA meeting. He was walking into an NA meeting. Okay. And we passed on the doorway and it was yeah. like, hey, you know. Right. And I, it's funny because I did research later in my life about love and attraction. And I used to think that if I caught a little buzz, that meant something. Right. And I realize now that it means nothing. It yeah. means it means my sick just found a sick. Right, right, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So yeah, I, uh, for sure. <laughs> so we got married. Uh, we were together for a while. We did a geographic from Maryland to North Carolina because that was probably. Yeah, I still had the anxiety and antsy and stuff, and um, I was started working for the health department. I was well, I started working for the health department in Maryland, but I was a health inspector. So oh, okay, I was the everywhere I went, nobody wanted me to be there. So for that restaurants, could, yeah, for restaurants. Yep, I used to be a chef. So ah, okay, <laughs> but so I worked for us. a place where you could probably eat off the floor. It was so clean. Oh yeah, they were crazy, which well, was the best. I'm I'm pretty sure that you, most of the problems I had were. Um, they didn't speak English very well. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I, I did work for a Greek once who was so disgusting that um, I didn't eat while I was working there. And then I left and I was like, why am I still here? Like after a week of, I just saw the most terrible things. Well, standards and, in other countries are different. That's why it's, it's really right. hard sometimes but to convey it. But also it's education in ter- what I learned is education in terms of like not knowing that like chicken, <laughs> salmonella and clean your use a different cutting board kind of thing exactly. anyway we don't yeah. have to get into yeah. that that's a oh, that's a different podcast i have stories oh i'm <laughs> sure i don't even want to know um but uh okay so you were a health inspector in north carolina now North carolina bought a house we <laughs> lived on i mean i thought everything was perfect we lived on sunrise circle my name is dawn i'm on sunrise circle right it i was love all that cute. little white house and I had I had a, a job. I became a supervisor, and everything was moving along. Mm-hmm. And we 
real, and you're both sober both sober uh we're doing a deal i got home groups i got sponsored blah 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 and i was like well what's next let's get pregnant mm -hmm. so i decided so we we decided to get pregnant we got pregnant and um this is one of those things where um i make plans and god laughs okay so I, I had a miscarriage okay i'm sorry to hear that and it's well the thing it doesn't it doesn't bother me now it bothered me at the time of course but because i was i was making my life and i was like forcing this is what i'm going to make my life to be mm -hmm. and when it didn't turn out right i actually ended up not relapsing with respect to drugs and alcohol but i did seek comfort in other sub other things which would be including the arms of a coworker. okay which destroyed my marriage. Right. And I'm, I mean, I'm stark, grave, and sober, but um, I was, I went, when... Not living like a life of integrity, you would say. Well, it's not even a life of integrity. It's more that when the going got tough, I didn't go to God. I went to a okay. physical person. Right. So I was looking for something outside of myself to change my insides, mm -hmm. to make me feel better. Yeah. And I didn't even realize I was doing it. it I got caught into this, um, you know, it, it, was so, it was so slow that it happened. And what, hap what happened was he, he, we were friends, and he f uh, followed me to the doctor's office that day. Mm -hmm. And when I walked out, I was devastated. And that was, the, that was where that kind of started. Right. And my husband was n not responsive. He was like, okay, well, all right, it's over. We'll try again. Right. He is, I mean, probably didn't understand, right? No, he didn't yeah. understand. No. And I was, I mean, totally at fault. So, in the poor, and then I, then I destroyed this guy's life. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm a train wreck, and I'm like 12 years, 10, 12 years in recovery. I'm, but I'm a train wreck, and I'm still selfish, self-seeking. Um, I'm thinking I'm doing a deal, but I'm, I'm, not mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean i am as best as i can but i'm staying sober so he, one day he calls up and he's like uh, uh i said oh i my sponsor's like you can't do this if you keep doing this i'm, I'm gonna fire you mm -hmm. i love hearing that <laughs> like when okay. people are like oh, i'm gonna fire you i'm like did you hire me yeah exactly what? so anyway <laughs> she, she call her back and she's like you, did you get rid of him i'm like no and she's like well you're fired okay that scared me i thank god that she did that because i was like oh no i'm gonna get i'm gonna i'm in trouble i'm gonna drink i'm gonna get drunk i don't know what's gonna happen i'm in trouble so i ran and i got another sponsor and i'm like you gotta help me she goes what's happened and i told her she goes well you gotta stop seeing that guy and i'm like Ugh. <laughs> damn <laughs> so i called him up i'm like look i gotta stop seeing you and he's like why and i'm like well my marriage split up and right. i really did wait and you're still married right right so the next thing i know he calls me back he goes all right i left her and i'm like oh shit that's not what i meant but he had left his wife and i'm like i still can't see you and i couldn't say my it's because of my sponsor he's not he wasn't in recovery so i basically kind of destroyed this poor guy's life so is it, it you couldn't see him the second time around even though he left his wife because she wanted you to stay single was that it or because you know if i don't understand well um it wasn't it wasn't her after it was about 30 days later and i realized there was nothing there for oh, me oh right I that's what i thought yeah, okay okay yeah but when you said her i was like yeah no. yeah 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 okay they, I realized like, after you were I, just a tool for me to I, exactly right. that's what I realized after was like I don't really have any feelings for this guy I was just kind of not needing I, something yeah I was hurting I was hurting and I was I was hurting other people mm -hmm. and, well I mean maybe he wasn't meant to be in his marriage if he was cheating too so just saying but anyway <laughs> anyway so eventually my husband's like oh let's get back together you leave you quit your job move to wilmington north carolina so i did all that i got there we hang out for a while i realized that was not going to work i left that marriage and i was like i know <laughs> florida florida has the answers right so i did a geographical yeah and i moved down to florida um 
a circum. I lived on a boat for a little while and kind of floated around. Were you South Florida? Did you go to the West? Like what? I went to the West Coast first. Mm -hmm. I was. My I don't mom know was, why I had a feeling you went to the West Coast first. Because I pointed that. Oh, way. maybe, maybe that's why. Yeah. <laughs> my my uh, mom lived in the villages, and I did some online dating. I met some guy on the on a boat. He's like, "Do you want to live here?" I'm like, "Okay, fine." Right. He was not in recovery. I'm like, "What? Am, I don't know what I was doing there." But uh, eventually, I left him and moved to South Florida and started to find meetings. So where's my first meeting? It was like the biker meeting. I'm like, okay. I like the biker meetings. Again, I'm still wrapped up into this. I don't know what it is about the bad boy, but it's like the, the, um, the electricity that I associated with attraction, which is really based on fear after I did research on love. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> was what I thought attraction was and mm -hmm. it's really about ticking the boxes on all your you know character defects and family um origin stuff and all that so if you liked if i if you liked me i didn't like you but if you didn't like me that much i liked you a lot right so i was i was pining after this one guy who was a biker and i ended up writing an article about uh something about it and my friend's like oh this is good you should publish it so I tried to publish it. Nobody took it. None of the magazines or anything took it. But there was a biker magazine in South Florida, and they said, oh, we'll take it. So they published it, and it was called Why Are We Attracted to the Worst Men? And it was about my attraction to bikers. Uh -huh. And he said, let's make this a column. You're going to write every month. Oh, cool. <laughs> and I'm like. Who knew that would happen? I, exactly. It was free, but. You know. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> but the funny part was this woman calls up. She goes, you know, I have the same attraction to bad boys. And um, I called the bad boy that I, I liked. And I said, hey, this woman who owns this bar has this, it was, says she has the same attraction. She, you know, and he had a band and he wanted to get the band into this bar. So I connected the two. And I thought if I connected the two, then he would like me more. Right. Yeah. And what it turned out, like, about 30 days, 60 days later, they got married. <laughs> so my bad boy left me for the bar, right, okay. the bar, the bar owner. And the, the magazine figured out who the bad boy was. So it was like this whole thing in the magazine about how uh, I got outed for, you know, wanting this one person who married somebody else. And right. Anyway, um, I kept writing them articles. And I got attracted to another guy. And then that fell through. And I got attracted to another guy. And I started, after a while, what happens is, you, and the reason why we're supposed to write things in the program is because we see a pattern. Mm -hmm. And in that articles, I started seeing a pattern. And it was embarrassing because it was, um, now it's, I'm 20 years in recovery by then. And it's public. You know, it's public. And I'm doing the same thing, expecting different results. Right. With relationships. Right. And finally, one day, I stopped. And it was, I wasn't 20 years. I was 17. 17 years of sobriety. And I stopped. And I hit an emotional bottom. I stopped trying to figure out what that piece was that was going to fix me. And I just sat still. And when I sat still, all this pain came up. And for the first time in recovery, I started meditating. And when I would sit to meditate, it would just tears. And I'd open my mouth, and it was that there was no sound coming out. It was so painful at the time. Wow. But I, but I just kept going. I just kept going. And, and I got, so you stayed single, and you're just like throwing. Well, you would hope I would stay single, right? Oh. I, <laughs> <laughs> I really like you. <laughs> <laughs> you would have thought I'd learn, right? I, I stayed single for like 30 days, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> But you started meditating. You I started, started seeing a pattern. I started seeing a pattern. I got a new sponsor. Okay. And I started working with her and telling her this pattern of what I have. And, and she's like, you know, you're pretty selfish. And you're pretty self-seeking. And what you're going to need to do is be more kind and loving. And it's like, if, when I'm in a relationship. Like a punch. Yeah. When I'm in a relationship. You're supposed to know exactly what I want. You're supposed to read my mind and do it. And if you don't, you're going to get penalized. Okay. And I'm not going to tell you why you're getting penalized. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's harsh. 
We, well, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know I was doing that though. Right. I just assumed if you love me, you, you knew, knew what I needed. Yeah, you knew it. Yeah. Exactly. And if you didn't know, you didn't love me. And if you didn't love me, then you're going to get penalized right, for not loving me. Yeah. See, of course. It makes sense. But it doesn't. But yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense, but it doesn't. Um, so I, I'm in my relationship, we're so overly communicative that it's almost like too much. You know, it's the opposite. It's like, this is what I need, you know, which is good. It's the, it's the first time in my life that I'm in some sort of healthy relationship because I'm actually communicating like what I need and, and listening to someone else's needs. But right. it's, it's before that was kind of like that, you yeah, know? Yeah, exactly. You know, okay. You don't love me. Yeah. Bye. I'm going to pout. Yeah. You don't know why I'm pouting, but. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I ended up going to a meeting. And I met this guy and we started to date and my sponsor was like, all right, you're going to do this differently. Um, you're going to be more loving and kind. So we, we one, one time we were sitting there talking about something and he, it was, it was like, I wanted something. I wasn't going to tell him what I wanted, it was, but he wasn't going to do it. And I called up my sponsor. I'm like, you're not going to believe this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And she starts cackling. I'm like, what? And she's like, you've met your match because he's not going to do what you want. And you're going to have to either be, accept that and move on. You right. can't try to change him. You can't try to manipulate it. You're, you know, you need to be in this clear. Right. And it was like, I didn't know how to do it. Didn't know how to do it. But I was going to try. So... I, um, we started dating and then I started, I was like, continued to write and I decided I wanted to write a book. Somebody had gone to a meeting, said I'd wrote a book. I'm like, I want to do that. So I wrote a book called the broken picker fixer because I assumed I was already healthy. Uh, <laughs> okay. I started dating somebody else and it wasn't a biker. So I, I mean, must be healthy. But you're getting better. I'm getting better. Right? And more self-awareness. I think self-awareness is the key, right? In the end of the day, we're always going to be at this work in progress. I feel like it doesn't stop. Right. Well, the broken picker fixture talks about uh, what we want to find in a person, meditation, all these things. That it's uh, like getting you ready for a relationship. Okay. So it, it was, it was a, it, it was, it really was a good, it's a great book. It yeah. is a great book. Um, and because it does, it finds patterns. A lot of times we'll either have a list that's too long for, that we want for a person that can never meet it, or we don't have a list at all. Right. We just like blow with the wind. Yeah. So I wrote that book. We're still in the relationship. I decided to write another book. I was going to become a love expert. Okay. I, I mean, you might be though. love. I am a love expert. Yeah, I, I am a love expert. No, no, this is good. So I started researching <laughs> the science of love from a biological standpoint. Oh, I love this. <laughs> this is like my cup of tea. Oh, you know, it was. So I spent five years. You know what I'm getting on Audible, like in a, in an hour, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I started. Um, I started researching, and, and the, my relationship was going good. But the problem was, I became almost like a little bit egocentric. It was like, look, I'm a love expert. This is what we need to do. So you're on your second book. Yes. You're now the expert. Yes. I'm a love expert. You're a love, you're a love expert. So you're like, this is how we do it. Exactly. And I'm, I'm going to my, my uh, boyfriend going, look, this is the way love works. And he's kind of going, well, I don't, I'm like, look, I know what it's supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd bring in, I would bring in manila folders full of research because I was, I, I worked at the uh, university. So I had access to all the re research, right. stacks and stacks of research. So I just spent days, I mean, five years, I worked on this book. I did the whole thing. I went to, I got an agent in New York. I got a, oh, wow. I did the, you know, I got a book deal wrote, you know, did the proposal, wrote the book. I got a publisher, which is HCI, which is um, the Chicken Soup for the Soul people. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chicken Soup for the Soul. I loved those books. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my God. I loved those books. And I did two TED Talks. Oh, wow. TED TEDx you. Talks. I had no idea. <laughs> oh, my God. I was doing a deal. I was yeah. doing, you know, and then when a uh, book published in 
uh, fall of 2017, October 2017, I started doing the, the TV tour. circuit tour. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to Nashville. I'm going to wherever, like whoever's, uh, what TV program awesome. will have me doing the radio thing and all that. And in December of 2017, okay, my boyfriend comes to me and says, I want to break up. Oh, no. And I'm like... <laughs> You can't break up because yeah. I'm a love expert. <laughs> <laughs> You're stuck with me. I can't be single. What is that? I mean, yeah. I can't break up. I, I would. How can a love expert have a broken relationship? Well, right. I'm not a love expert anymore, am I? Well, you still are. You still did all the research. I think you are. But uh, yeah, no. And we had been together for about 11 years and everything just crumbled. It just all ended. Right. I wanted to, you know, still try to be a love expert, but I really couldn't. I had the, uh, I mean, but even love experts, sometimes it doesn't work out, right? So I had the writer of, uh, Atlantic Constitution, Constitutional, which is one of the bigger, uh, uh, newspapers on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So she's interviewing me. It was fortunately it was over the phone and she's asking me these questions about my book and about my research and what I really need to know for people to tell them. And my, my tagline was that, that true love is, you know, is as out there and is available for anyone. And I started, my voice started to crack. I started to cry mm -hmm. and I was like, God, God, don't let her hear that. Don't let it hear that. And I realized I couldn't continue on. I couldn't do it. I couldn't, I couldn't do an interview because I was going to start bawling in the middle of the interview. Right. So basically everything came crashing down. I had to move out of the house. I moved into a trailer in South Florida. Now I pick on trailers because when I first moved to South Florida, I lived in, I lived in uh, Wilma came. Oh yeah. And I was only here like about you know, a month or two when Wilma came and I was working at Broward college uh, Broward community college at the time in one of the secretaries after Wilma never came back. And I'm like, what happened to the secretary? And they were like, oh, she lived in a trailer. She's homeless now. The oh. trailer's gone from Wilma. And I'm like, what idiot has a trailer in a hurricane zone? This one. <laughs> so now I'm living in this trailer. Right. Well, there's a whole area up here called Briny Breezes that's all trailers, and it's like the most expensive, most exclusive. You know, well, there's apparent. tons of trailer yeah. parks, but that was my experience. So I'm like, oh, I'm in, you know, I'm in this trailer park. So it was like, it, it, it was just felt like this bottom. It was, it really was a bottom. Yeah. I, my relationship was over. My career as a love expert was over. Everything just, it was just dust dust you don't believe that though now right that, that it's the best gift that ever happened to me right it's the greatest blessing i've ever experienced so i decided i'm going to take that year that i never took out of a relationship no relationship no relationship that's the best yes I needed to take that year because I kept looking for that thing that was going to fix me. Right. And I didn't do it perfectly. I didn't do it perfectly. I kept going, I'm not going to do it. Well, maybe I'll just do it. I'm not going right. to do it. Let me just put have my, a couple of dates. <laughs> yeah. Let me put a couple of dates on here. And then I, right. and I actually did. I, um, I, I feel bad about it. So I, I did a, I put a thing on match or something and I went on a date. I met this wonderful guy. He was very sweet. We went down, we had lunch. He was a doctor and he was like, he had everything all the boxes were checked, right? And he goes, he goes, well, you're great. He goes, he goes, what happened? And I told him that my relationship just ended. He goes, do you ever think you'd get back together? And I paused. I didn't know what to say because I was still in love with my ex. Yeah. And he goes, your silence says everything I need to know. Right. And I realized I was out there hurting people again because of my own selfish needs. And I was like, okay got it i'm not doing this i'm again, not gonna do this right. yeah i'm not yeah. doing this again yeah so i took some time and i was worried i was like I mean, it's a first date so you're allowed to you know you didn't hurt him too much right <laughs> but, but no but i'm that's awesome that you stopped yourself yeah yeah i that's mean it's awesome it, just his the the way he said it, it it looked like it was painful you know so uh and you're right. It was the first date, but I'm not going to minimize that I was out there when I shouldn't been. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was out there doing damage. I was self-seeking. Yeah. 
And I was, there was a time I was worried. I'm like, I'm never going to find love again. And, um, and, but I decided to take the time to, again, I, when I, when I paused, the pain came up, the crying came up. Um, but I started self-seeking or not self-seeking, uh, spiritually seeking. Yeah. And every time I hit one of those bottoms, I got more spiritual, you know, more spiritual growth. Right. So I had, I had done with it. When I had 17 years, when I hit that bottom, I did like drumming circles and, you know, I went oh, to I all these different that. things, yeah, you know, yeah. and this time I was, you know, I was doing other things and I took a course in, um, two way prayer. And I didn't realize that, that Dr. Bob and Bill had done two-way prayer in the beginning. Yeah, and, and there's a pamphlet, and it's like, um, it's a two-way prayer pamphlet, and it's uh, God, listening to God, I think, mm -hmm. something like that, like listening to God or something. And I, I, I was really into it for like a year. Yeah, well, I had the crazy brain. So I was like, all right, I'm going to try this two-way prayer. And it says, you're going to ask a question, you're going to meditate, and then you're going to free write right. your yeah. answers. yeah. So my question was like, all right, God, what do I need to do? And I'd get like this whole thing. And at the end, it would go all is well. And I'm like, oh, God, you're not understanding the question. What do I need to do? And he's like, all is well. I'm like, no, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> I got to do something. I can't just sit here and believe that all is well. And finally, after a while, I was like, oh, maybe all is well. Maybe I don't have to keep forcing and trying to do something and trying to seek something. Maybe if I just let go, everything would be okay. Yeah. That's and hard though to do. It was. It was. But I finally got to that point where I did let go. And I let go of all of everything that I needed. Everything I thought I needed. All of a sudden that trailer became the sweetest home in the world. I was making myself, you know, paleo muffins in the morning. And <laughs> I was... You know, I had a job. It wasn't the greatest, but I was like, you know, working it. Um, and I was enjoying, I was enjoying my life. Then this hurricane came. Which one? I forgot what it was. I forgot. Irma? It might have been. No, that was too it was. It was a hurricane that really didn't turn into much. Yeah, yeah, one of those. It was one of those. Because I was here by then. We're talking 2018-ish. Yeah, about 2018. Yeah, I think it was Irma or something. So the I had she to missed us. I had to evacuate though. It's mandatory evacuation in a trailer. So my ex boyfriend was like, well, "Do you want to stay here?" And I said, "Sure." So I, I showed up. I had like two boxes. I was sure I was going to lose everything again. Right. I mean, like everything. I had like boxes. I had like my grandmother's china and you know like a. <laughs> The China. <laughs> I always wonder about this stupid China. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> like some journal books and some China. It's like, yeah, I, yeah. I, you know, what do I really save? You know, and my what, dog's tucked right, under my what arm. What do you really save? <laughs> the China. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I ended you up. You better use that China. <laughs> I do. Okay. Well, I kind of, well, I'll, I'll tell yeah. you. Um, so uh, I stayed with him and he, he's, he realized there was a difference. I wasn't that controlling, grasping person. And he had his own growth thing to do at the time, too. So we started kind of getting closer again. And then he asked, uh, my dad came down to live with me. My dad got sick. And my dad uh, fell. And he couldn't stay in my trailer because I had steps. Mm -hmm. So we ended up moving in back with Ed um, to help m with my dad. And eventually, Ed came to me and he said, will you marry me? <laughs> oh, wow. So he, became, so he came back. Yeah, he yeah. came back. You let go and he came back. Mm -hmm. We've been married for four years. Oh, my God. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, but I'm assuming you're not like, I'm the love expert. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You're going to do as I say. But so now do you still feel like you're the love expert? No, I let that go. Right. Okay. I let it go. I mean, I but still, it seems like you figure, you know, you, maybe you can write a, a you know, a follow up to the book. I could. Yeah. I could. I still, I mean, I, the book is still published. Yeah. You know, I still get calls on it all the time and I'd still do uh podcasts and 
whatever people want. I get, I even get students that are asking me questions for their That's so cool. <laughs> writing yeah. their papers yeah. and stuff. Um, and I still teach, but I started doing more recently. I went back to my art. The, which was my first love, but I thought that I couldn't do. Yeah, I heard you say that earlier, and and that that was made me a little sad because you know art is something I think everyone can can express, mm -hmm. you know, in some way. So for the last year, I've been doing art shows. I've been in Los Olas. I've been. That's so cool. I, you have to send me your work. I will. And um and and when we post and do some reels, I'll also post your art. You know, because I love to support people and whatever their passion is. Um, so it's been quite the journey. It has been yeah, quite the journey. Yeah. Alcoholism was easy compared to recovery. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's so funny. It, I, feel, I feel the same. It can be very hard. You well, know? well, let me back up for a second. Because uh, I say I've been married for four years. And it, it, it's almost like one of the things that pissed me off is those fairy tales. It was like, and then they got together and they lived happily ever after. And it's like, no. Right. It's hard. The, yeah. I'm sure. It's not hard. Right. It's not really hard. But I have to, you have to be conscious. And a lot of times we go unconscious and just do things. And I have to like stop myself and be like, you know, I really didn't mean that. Yeah. I just said something stupid. I really didn't mean that. Yeah. And um, one of the things my sponsor told me was you know, whenever I got upset you had to be kind she always had me make him a cup of tea go now go back in and ask, see if he wants a cup of tea and I'm like all right and I'm going in you, you want a cup of tea <laughs> <laughs> here's her cup of tea that's so funny and we've been together for like 18 years and um wow. la uh, about six months ago not even three months ago I said let me ask you something did you drink tea prior to me making you tea he's like never Never drank tea. That's <laughs> but he so drinks, funny. He, he drinks, drinks tea, tea every yeah. every night. He gets tea. Yeah, that's so funny. Well, I mean, that's an incredible story. So, so now I'm going to ask you: Is there anything you want to share that you haven't first? No, probably will pop up as soon as you ask the question. I'll be like, oh wait, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. So, I ask this of everyone, and and you know, it's always a, a different answer. Some of them are similar, but if you could go back and Tell your younger self something, you know, you know, how old would that younger self be? Like, what do you picture in your mind? And what would you tell your younger self if you could say anything? Um, probably that you're enough. And I really didn't. So that was probably what I learned mostly in that trailer. And I, now I remember what I want to say. I want to back up. What, somebody told me when I was in that trailer, they said, can you love him even if he loves somebody else and I was like my first response was like hell no right. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like well you've been together for a long time you've always loved him it was conditional love if he has to love you back can you love him unconditionally and I had to like mill on that for a while and I finally got to the point where I was like all right I can love him if that's what his true path is I can love him and bless him and allow him to go on that path. Yeah. And then I have to believe that God has a path that's for me. So I had to go from life is happening to me to life is happening for me. I love that. I love that. And when I was in that trailer, that's what I realized. I realized there was a couple times where I was like, but I'm never going to find love again. And I'm driving down the street and this guy stops and asks me for next to me at the light and says, hey, can I get your phone number? I'm like, okay, God, I got it. There's going to be more out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was, I was having these like little miracle moments all the way through those. I mean, you're a beautiful woman. Well, thank you. And okay. so, you know. But I, I hold down men and tell them, say me, you love me though. <laughs> <laughs> and they say no. So you never know. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, we all have our, have our moments. Right. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. And now it's time for the hug. Okay. We're going to oh. get up and hug. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, oh,